Good afternoon. My name is Scott Anderson, President and CEO of Zions Bank. And it's my honor to welcome all of you to our Zions Community Speaker Series, The State of Affordable Housing, Solving for Housing in the Economic Equation. The question for today is, does affordable housing still exist? Well, many residents in Idaho, Utah, and Wyoming are still feeling the effects of the pandemic. They are also feeling the effects of our population growth and the impact it's having on our housing market. Far too many families in our communities can afford to buy homes in their home state. Today's community speaker series will examine the current state of affordable housing and explore ways to keep home ownership within reach of all families. We are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear and to learn from a panel of community leaders who are so passionate and so dedicated to making home ownership a reality for all families. Our panel will feature David Damson, President and CEO of the Utah Housing Corporation, Bud Comfort, CEO of Neighborhood Works Boise, Kate Clunt, Government Affairs Director for the Utah Association of Realtors, and Tama Hunkin Lawson, a real estate agent in Utah. I want to thank our One Zions team for organizing and producing today's event. And thanks to all of you who have chosen to Zoom in to our community speaker series today. It is my hope that you will take what you learned today and continue the conversation with your teams, your friends, and your families. We appreciate the valuable contributions you make to building an informed society where we can all continue to learn and live and thrive together because building a culture of inclusion begins with us. It begins with me and it begins with you. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn the time over to Sulane Pinoke, our Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And I might also add that Sulane was recently honored by the Salt Lake Chamber with its Pathfinder Award. I want to congratulate Su Lang on this honor and for helping us find the better path at science and in our communities of inclusion and equality, where we all have the opportunity to prosper. Su Lang will introduce our guests and moderate today's conversation. Su Lang. Thank you so much, Scott, for that warm welcome and acknowledgement. It was truly an honor to be acknowledged by the Salt Lake Chamber on Monday at the Women in Business Conference. So thank you so much for acknowledging that. Uh, and as Scott stated, we are truly honored to hear from such dedicated community leaders in today's community speaker series. The state of affordable housing, solving for housing in the economic inclusion equation. Today, we will address the question, does affordable housing still exist? While many Utahns and Idahoans are still facing the effects of the pandemic, they're also feeling the effects of our population growth and the impact it's having on our housing market. Utahns and Idahoans can't afford to buy homes in their home states. So in today's conversation, we will examine the current state of our housing market and explore ways to keep home ownership within reach for all families. With no further ado, I would like to introduce our community speakers and dive right into the conversation. Please join me in welcoming David Damshin, President and CEO of the Utah Housing Corporation, Bud Comper Jr., CEO of NeighborWorks Boise, Kate Clunt, Government Affairs Director for the Utah Realtors Association, and Tema Hunkin Lawson, a seasoned real estate agent right here in the state of Utah. Thank you all for joining us today. Our audience is very excited to hear from all of you, as am I. So I'm going to uh, give an opportunity for each of you to share a little bit about your background and your work. And then we are going to dive into some questions from our audience. So let's start with David Damshin. David and I have become good friends because David is the founder of the Women in the Money Utah Financial Empowerment Conference. I love that title. Uh, and the state Utah State Treasurer's Office launched that conference in 2019. So we share a common passion for financial empowerment for women. David was the 25th Utah State Treasurer from 2015 to 2021. In 2018, he was voted Senior Vice President of the National Association of State Treasurers. And then the following year, he was elected President of the Association. In April of this year, he became President and CEO of the Utah Housing 
Corporation. So welcome to the conversation, David Damshin. Now, two things I wanted to pose to you. Clearly, you've been successful in building a career in public service. Tell us your why for pursuing a career in housing. Was this your childhood dream? I want to grow up and be the state treasurer of Utah. <laughs> Was Monopoly your favorite game as a child? Tell us a little bit about that. And then please share with us a brief snapshot of Utah's current housing market. What are the greatest disparities exist based on recent data? And what are the common barriers to home ownership in the state of Utah? Thank you, Sarang. So good to be with you all today. Um, uh, like all of us, I didn't know what a state treasurer was when I was young. Uh, and when I ended up in the role, I was pinching myself. Uh, what a great opportunity to serve the people of Utah. Um, I started early in my banking career serving the homeless in Seattle. And that's where the, the passion starts. Later, I served on the board of what is now Lantern House, the homeless shelter up in Ogden uh, during my time here in Utah. Of the 19 boards and commissions I served on as state treasurer, I was on the Utah Housing Corporation board and saw the incredible work that's done here at Utah Housing Corporation, which is Utah's housing finance agency. We help people accomplish home ownership, and we also help finance affordable rental housing with the, the low-income housing tax credit. Um, but I was also chairman of the Utah Navajo Trust Fund Board of Trustees, and we were able to build homes for Utah Navajos down in San Juan County. I have to say, of all the wonderful things I was able to do as treasurer, uh, working with Utah Housing Corporation and working with Utah Navajos and, and helping them uh, achieve affordable housing, safe, clean, and affordable housing uh, were among the, the favorite things uh, that I was able to do. And so I'm excited to, to make it a full-time gig here at Utah Housing Corporation. I think that in terms of obstacles, I think we 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 all generally appreciate that the lingering effects of the global financial crisis are a part of the problem. Uh, a lot of builders went out of business, stopped building back in 2008, 2009. And so we had a decade long uh, uh, drought of development and construction. And we fell far, far behind. Here in Utah, as many as 40,000 units. And right now we think we're still behind by over 30,000 units. So we have a supply demand imbalance of extraordinary magnitude. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two is uh, headwinds with the economy. The Federal Reserve, as we know, is is uh, committed to price stability. And uh, we, we follow the Fed funds increases uh, pretty closely, but uh, maybe we're not that mindful of the Fed's balance sheet, which is over $8 trillion. A lot of what's on the Fed's balance sheet is mortgage-backed securities. They're not buying mortgage-backed securities anymore. And when Fed, uh, Fed Chair Powell was asked recently, hey, these rising interest rates is creating dislocations in the housing market. When will the Fed start caring about housing and not so much uh, you know, tackling inflation? And Chair Powell said, no time soon. So what we're seeing with interest rates is a big part of the challenge and we best not hold our breath waiting for things to change anytime soon in terms of Fed policy and interest rates. And of course, house, uh, home prices have uh, risen sharply in both the Idaho and Utah markets. And, and, and that is obviously a big part of the equation as well. Wow, thank you so much, um, David, for that snapshot of Utah's housing market. Uh, and just with, real quick follow up, any resources that you can pinpoint are uh, for our audience today? I know the Utah Diversity, Diversity in Utah data book has been extremely helpful from the Kim Garner Policy Institute. Any other resources that people can turn to? It's really important that people understand that housing finance agencies in pretty much all states, including Idaho and Utah, offer down payment assistance. And so we are helping people achieve home ownership even now with down payment assistance at Utah Housing Corporation. So ask your mortgage lender about Utah Housing Corporation down payment assistance. We also have a special down payment assistance grant program for law enforcement and corrections officers that was appropriated, uh, the legislature appropriated 5 million during the 2022 general session. And we're administering that grant right now. So for law enforcement and corrections officers, uh, that's that's a real resource. And we're going back to the legislature during the 2023 session for appropriations for a similar program for teachers and emergency first responders. Mm, fantastic. Oh my gosh, tremendous resources we have right here at our fingertips. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we are going to jump to Bud Comfort Jr. Uh, Bud and I are also quickly becoming good friends as there are a number of similarities between Utah and Idaho when it comes to our local economies. Uh, Bud Comfort Jr.'s career spans well over 20 years. 13 of which he served an active role in managing nonprofit housing programs. 
Throughout his career, he has worked to develop single family housing throughout Idaho in collaboration with both state and federal programs, which has led him to his current role as CEO of NeighborWorks Boise, an amazing, amazing work you are doing there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And the same questions, same two questions to you. Can you share with us your why for pursuing a career in housing? And then could you please share a brief snapshot of Idaho's housing market? And what are some of the disparities and barriers to home ownership that currently exist in Idaho? Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to join you. Uh, just a, a great team here uh, that we'll be sharing with you over the course of the next hour. I represent one of four NeighborWorks networks, uh, both two in Idaho and two in Utah. So Utah would be the Mountain West uh, Country Home Solutions and obviously NeighborWorks Salt Lake. And then one in um, uh, two in Idaho, NeighborWorks Pocatello, and NeighborWorks Boise. So that, that NeighborWorks network is four of 250 organizations across the nation that help uh, to serve our communities in this way. And, and really for me, the why was as I grew up, I grew up in a small town in Idaho. I'd say the name, but no one would know where it was. Um, <laughs> and, and that was, but I, I grew up in that understanding of the value of home. I actually worked my way through college on construction crews and knew the importance of the bricks and sticks. But I say, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't until I had my first child and uh, just the burden of, hey, I have to, I have a family here I'm take, having to take care of. So we hear a lot about just the safe and secure, healthy environments for our family, but it really hit home when it was my family and I needed to find that space. Uh, how do we, what are those opportunities? And that was a few years ago, I will say. Um, but uh, I'm excited to see many uh, many more opportunities now than even presented then. Uh, some of the challenges here in, uh, in, in Idaho uh, is probably very familiar. Idaho and Utah were always just first or second. It's, we're just chasing each other and sometimes not always the good thing. Idaho now is in, that, in the first spot for the most appreciated market, which isn't the area that you want to be in. Um, but it, and we've, and we've had a, a bit of a road to get here. I'd say Idaho is facing an unprecedented housing crisis related to rising rents and um, the appreciation of home values that led to kind of the renewed conversation amongst city leaders and state um, uh, um, facilities to say, how do we address some of these issues? Um, the cities are looking at policies and zoning and uh, programs and partnerships uh, that to, to try to bring some uh, relief. Uh, this is both a, as an urban, uh, Idaho still very rural in general. And so housing demand, AKA population growth, uh, this housing supply earlier this year, um, you know, we were at 0.5 months of inventory. Uh, now we're at 2.7 months of, of housing inventory. Uh, and as we get to hear from uh, Tema, that's you know the balance budget balance in there is between four and six months of inventory. So we're heading in the right direction. Um, cost of housing, looking at the last ten years, has jumped four hundred and twelve percent. When you start looking at wow. what homes were costing then to what they're costing now, our average medium sales price just in the Boise market right now is five hundred sixty-five thousand. So. Um, those, are the, those are the pressures, and that, that also leads to the land costs that are escalating. We are seeing some reduction of that. We're glad to see more homes available uh, in the market. And now uh, it's how do we deal with that? How can we help homeowners get into that home and looking for those subsidies and down payment assistance uh, uh, that, that we offer as well? Wow, thank you so much for that snapshot of Idaho, very similar to Utah. Um, and any Resources in Idaho that you'd like to highlight here? NeighborWorks has down payment assistance. We're one of two nonprofit lenders in Idaho uh, designed specifically to take and leverage those, those funds to help families get into a home. Um, counselor, uh, all of our, our NeighborWorks organizations have counseling um, and, and these resources. So I can pin the, the links to uh, all four organizations in Idaho and Utah uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, education is power when people understand what these steps are and how to come to the table when, they, when they're home, there is a home available to be ready and prepared to be a homeowner. Um, we've been through the foreclosure crisis and back in the day, and those that take home buyer education are one third less likely to foreclose on their home. So we want families to stay in their homes once they get them. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. 
So we're going to jump to Kate Clunt, my policy partner. Uh, I met Kate at the Women in the Money Conference, uh, and she was back in September. She was a speaker on the opening panel, and immediately I was like, uh, I want her uh, to be featured in our next community speaker series on housing, and here we are. Kate is the Government Affairs Director for the Utah Association of Realtors. This is a very powerful position, uh, and she has served in this role for four and a half years. Prior to that, she was the Community and Government Relations Director for World Trade Center Utah, uh, Communications Director for Utah Association of Public Charter Schools, and a Deputy Press Secretary for the Utah House of Representatives. So Kate and I share a very similar passion for women, politics, and media. Uh, Kate also represents the millennial generation and serves on the board of the Emerging Leaders Initiative. Uh, so Kate, two questions to you. Can you also share your why for pursuing a career in public policy and government affairs. Uh, and then the second part is recognizing Utah as the youngest state with the highest millennial population per capita in the country, second only to Washington, DC. As a millennial, can you share where millennials stand on housing in the current market? Um, you shared some interesting research in our prep call and would love for you to share those findings with our panel and audience here today. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Um, so I, graduated into a recession because I am a millennial. So in 2011, 12-ish, I was looking for a job and I um, really wanted it to be in politics. And so I, I took any job in politics that I could, any internship. Some of them were paid, some of them were unpaid, but eventually it led me to a state politics. And I ended up really enjoying it because I don't know if you guys are frustrated with Washington, DC, but I'm endlessly frustrated with Washington, DC. And I found that at a state level, government affairs was really accessible and that you could actually see and make change and that it impacted your life on a really day-to-day -day basis in a way that maybe the president doesn't. And so that, that really drew me. And then the other thing with that was the, com the communications aspect of it was taking something kind of complicated and distilling it so that like my mom could understand because she doesn't like politics at all <laughs> was also something that was really appealing to me because I think that the more that people understand what their government can do for them, what it does do for them, uh, the better government we have because the more involved people will be. So that's kind of how I got started in government affairs and public policy. Um, I am a millennial and I think that sometimes people hear the term millennial and they think, college or like like pretty young but we're getting old we're getting older it's about <laughs> 20 to 41 at this point so we're we're fully in our adulthood um years and kind of like like um david mentioned there was a shortage of homes built um during the recession and there was a shortage of wage increases and even jobs during the recession. And that led a lot of millennials to take on more student loans, to go to graduate school or things like that. And so that we kind of graduated into a recession with a lot of debt. And so they, millennials weren't able to take advantage of the last few years, well, not the last three years before that, they weren't able to take advantage of those home prices. And so, because they were paying off debt and whatnot. And so you'll find, and, and this is what I shared in our, our prep call, but fewer than half of millennials at the age of 30 own a home. And when you compare that to the generations that preceded them, it's much lower. Uh, particularly when you compare them to baby boomers, it's about 20 points lower, 20 percentage points. Um, and that can have long lasting implications for wealth building, closing the income gap, and then even just being prepared for retirement, since that is a, a really common way for people to save for the end of their career and the end of their life. And so that has gotten us really involved as an organization in terms of making sure that there is accessible, affordable housing for people who would like to purchase a starter home, whether or not that's a condo or a, townhome or a single family home. So that's kind of where millennials are right now. We're a little, we're a little bit behind, but I hear that if we give up the avocado toast, we'll we'll get there eventually. <laughs> right. I know that's like racking up all of our bills, the avocados. Um, and on that note, would you say majority of that, right, that decrease in home ownership, is it attributed to affordability or preference? Uh, because I know a, a lot of people don't want to own, you know, younger people don't want to own homes. They don't want to deal with that. They want to move around, try out different cities. Does that come up in conversation? It does come up. It does come up. And there are there is a group of people who would prefer to rent rather than buy. 
Um, the issue that I think millennials are running into is that there are lots of them that want to buy and there's nothing for them to buy. And so to that kind of distinction Why and that? that preference is really important, right? Like if you, if you want to buy it and it doesn't exist, then that creates a little bit of a problem for you. And then your preference kind of has to be that you rent <laughs> instead of buy. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we are now going to jump to Tema Hunkin Lawson. Tema and I share a common cultural heritage as Pacific Islander women here in the state of Utah. Uh, and Tema may not know this, but I was a big fan of your father's for years during my time in Washington. Uh, Tema's father, Amy F. Fala, and I'm going to butcher the name. Okay. <laughs> Would you mind pronouncing? Sure. Fale o Mavayanga. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, was American Samoa's longest serving delegate to the House of Representatives. And so we ran in a lot of similar circles in the AAPI community back in Washington, D.C. Um, he served for 13 consecutive terms from 1989 to 2014 uh, and just wanted to honor his legacy here today. Uh, I share this because Tema's commitment to our Pacific Islander community, as well as her community here in Utah, is in her DNA. And the work that she was doing through the real estate industry is carrying on her father's legacy. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we had acknowledged that. Um, you are helping members of the Pacific Islander community build a home for their families in the mainland, right? That is huge. All the way from the islands to the mainland. There's a big difference between selling houses and building homes. And home is where you find family and community. And it is the center of every Pacific Islander culture. So wanted to make sure that we noted that. A little bit about Tema. Tema, she's a rock star, has been a licensed real estate agent for 21 years with a short break for grad school. Her career start was in Las Vegas in 2001 when that market was exploding. She later came to Utah to raise scholarship funds for international students at BYU Hawaii while also selling real estate. Fast forward last year, she was ranked in the top 250 of Utah County uh, and number 12 of 1,100 agents in her statewide brokerage. Congratulations on that ranking. Uh, so Tema, please share with us more about your passion for pursuing a career, a career in real estate and the intentionality behind your business strategy. It's very unique. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you, especially David, because I 38% of the homes that I close are with Utah Housing Loans. So I am super, awesome. super grateful for the Utah Housing Program. And everyone that's watching this, if you don't know about that program, you need to research it because it is, it is to benefit all of the BIPOC community. And so, so I want your number, David. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but I, I will say my why. Gosh, you know, I, I actually worked for a commercial real estate firm in Washington, D.C., um, just out of college. And so that kind of sparked my interest in the industry. And life would have it where my sister and I decided to leave the Washington, D.C. area and move to Las Vegas because that market was just booming. And we got to see firsthand what that was like and experience um, the market then. There's nothing more um, rewarding. You know, real estate, it's a lot of work. Let me tell you, it is a lot of work to be a real estate agent. It's we don't have a set schedule. Everyone says, oh, you can be your own boss and you can leave work when you want. No, that's not true. <laughs> it's a lot of work and a lot of long hours and weekends and nights. And um, why I do it is it's to help families get into homes and to get out of renting. There is no other reason. I mean, yes, sometimes the money can be great and that's wonderful, but um, considering how much work it is, and often how much sleep is lost. I, it's crazy how I'll talk to clients at 11 p.m. because they have to wait till their kids are down, right? And home is settled. And then we're doing real estate at 10, 11, 12. And so it's a lot of work, but I, I do it because um, I want to help our community. I really want to help um, people of all ethnicities get into homes. And we all know that that's the quickest way to build wealth. And that can be generational. And so it is just rewarding and um, such a blessing to be a part of this part of a family's journey in life. And so that's why I do it. <laughs> Beautiful. And you're so good at it. Uh, can you share a little bit about your, your book of business? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I went back and kind of um, assessed 
the clientele that I've helped in the last five years. And I was actually pretty happy that 85% of the families that I've helped in the last five years are from our BIPOC community and our minorities. And 38%, like I said, use the Utah housing loan. I mean, it's 100% of my business is by referral only. And so that just kind of naturally happens that I'm in the community and I'm getting out there and then they will refer their friends and family. And so I just, um, I'm proud of our community. I honestly am. I, sometimes I, I, I don't often like it when I hear people say, oh, we need to help them. We need to help them. Our Pacific Islanders, I'll speak to them about them. We are intelligent. We're educated, you know, but we also come from a society of community. And so Sometimes we have to just figure out how to restructure our finances because we live in a world where it's all about family. And so if auntie needs me to co-sign on a car loan, I'm going to do it. Or if I need to give $5,000 to a funeral, I'm going to do it. Right. And so I think it's just kind of bringing all of those family values mm -hmm. um, kind of into perspective to better structure and then prepare ourselves to, to buy homes. And so it's amazing. I also want to share that in the state of Utah right now, we have at least, I want to say at least 150 to 200 real estate agents that are Pacific Islanders. Mm -hmm. And so each of them have their spheres of influence, right? And they're helping in every way they can. So the same goes for in lending and construction. And I mean, it is pretty amazing to see the evolution of how Pacific Islanders are now in this industry and we're here to stay. So it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing uh, more about your story and your passion. Um, and I would agree as a member of the PI community, Pacific Islander community, um, all we need is opportunity, opportunity yeah. and access to capital. Um, and when you have for generations been denied access and opportunity, once it is given to you, you take advantage of it um, and you do not take that responsibility lightly. Um, and I love how beautifully and eloquent you <laughs> described um, our culture uh, intertwined with, you know, the way that we manage wealth. Um, and so there's, there's learning opportunities there, right? Um, but together as a community, we, we're going to help each other. You know, none of us are in this alone. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for sharing your why. I've always been a firm believer of, your why being is such a, um, a, a critical influencer in the manner in which you lead. Uh, and so I would argue all of you are so successful in, in the housing arena because of your why. Um, and on that note, I wanted to use the power of community storytelling to shape the narrative of today's housing market as well. Um, but I know you have a couple of examples of personal stories of families um, that you've worked with over the past couple of years that showcase how the housing market has impacted specific demographics within Idaho's community. Um, would you mind sharing those with us now? You bet. Sometimes we get caught up on just the big uh, multifamilies or the big developments that we pull together. And NeighborWorks Boise really started from the idea of how can we just help families paint their home? And so paint the town was born. This is our 40th year. And as an example, um, uh, Tom, a lifelong resident of Boise, uh, was a veteran, um, suffered with Parkinson's disease for several years. And so this was a, a small way that we, we could come around him as a community NeighborWorks really is just that conduit for our community, this building engagement. How can we surround and encourage uh, folks like Tom? Another one was just this last Saturday, um, you know, uh, Janice, we have Rake Up Boise, Garden City, CUNA, uh, Meridian, we just kind of do it all. But this is an opportunity again for us to be a conduit for our community. Zion's Bank had a team actually on there. Uh, Shantain uh, led that. And, and we were able to, to help families across, you know, 700 yards were raked, 350 families. But really, you think about a, a volunteer force of over 4,000 came, uh, you know, this, together last Saturday to help our community. In this case, Janice was struggling with cancer, wasn't sure how to just take care of some of those basic needs as it relates to just getting ready for winter. Um, and, and this was a, an opportunity for our community uh, to just come in and support her. Um, her kids uh, sobbed actually when they saw that 
you know, what was happening when they pulled up to the drive and seeing someone else care for their family. So, you know, th that's, that's an example. Um, we've helped a, a, a recent mother uh, who um, has uh, uh, a single mom that didn't ever think that uh, owning a home could have ever been in her future through some home buyer education and our, and our counseling departments um, was able to do some down payment assistance. David, these are probably stories you see all the time. And that became a place where she could call home, a safe place for her family, uh, given what she experienced. And so this really is the this, this story that we tell to, to build up our communities. And it, and it is somewhat is the fuel uh, for me to, to, to for, and, and, and many of you, Tamara, I'm thinking of those late nights when you're like, why am I doing this? These are, these are the little stories that come about and give us the fuel to keep doing what we do. Wow, thank you so much for sharing all of those personal stories of the impact, right? So much of this work is life-saving and life-changing um, and truly building community through home ownership. Uh, and Tim, I wanna jump back to you as well. I know you have a couple of personal stories you would like to share. Yes, thank you. Um, every transaction that's closed is a story, right? Every family has a story. They all have a journey. And I look back on several, every time someone closes on a home, I look back and I go back to like the first time they reached out to me. And many times it's about a year. That's kind of the average. They start that process with trying to get pre-approved and, you know, holidays hit. So they take a break and then they start again. And so that's one thing that I think is interesting is it is a process. And as long as a family is willing to stick to it, they, they will succeed and they will eventually get to that finish line. Um, a couple of stories, gosh, uh, as I kind of pick and choose, I worked with a family, um, which is great homeowners that, um, keep their homes for a long time. For example, in the Bay area of California, um, I helped a family. They had, let's see, four, five, six, about eight people living in a three bedroom, one bathroom house. And it was super old. And they sold that in California and they were able to move into a buy with cash, a seven bedroom house here that has since appreciated. I mean, I hate to say it because I don't want to promise numbers to anyone else, but I mean, hundreds of thousands, right? The appreciation, which is now going to set up this family for the grandchildren, right? will eventually be able to buy homes. Um, the mother in that family is stricken to a wheelchair and um, such a blessing because they had the funds from the sale in California to then install in their home um, a wheelchair lift to get her from the garage into the home. And so they have since shared their story with many others. And so we're getting quite a flood of people from the Bay Area that are able to, to utilize their equity and buy here. Um, several stories, obviously in the last few years, during the pandemic, the market was insane. We can all understand that. And so clients that I helped right before that their equity was just absolutely incredible. And so I've helped several families that were able to use that to then buy their next home quickly in a short period of time. Um, a fun transaction I closed was with, um, let's see, I was the buyer's agent. The sellers were Polynesian. Their tenants were Polynesian in this rental. Their buyers were Asian and those, that buyer's agent was Asian and everyone went to BYU Hawaii. <laughs> we were all alumni of BYU wow. Hawaii. And I love that because it had to do with renters who then bought um, a sale. It was an investment property for Polynesians. Asians were able to, it was just a really cool mix. And that just goes to show that our AAPI or BIPOC community is definitely, um, they're buying homes and it's great and it's exciting. And yes, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot more families to help but we're on our way. And so anyway, I can share story after story, but I am. Oh my gosh. Um, it is fun. <laughs> Tema, I'm having so much fun just listening to you and congratulations on all your success and all the, this wealth building that you are bringing to our community. That is so, so important and will benefit generations 
to come. Um, so I want to dive into, we got so many questions submitted for this particular conversation. So I wanted to use the rest of our time to address some of those. And I just want to invite all of our panelists to unmute themselves and just chime in as you feel uh, inspired to respond. The first one is the term affordable housing itself. Is it problematic? Does it refer to something that is less desirable? Um, what are some thoughts there? Are there other terms that people are using in the market, in the industry? But I can speak to that a little bit. I think uh, affordable housing is what it is. Whether you're a millionaire, you're going to look for something you can afford. But uh, in many times, it gives uh, that negative connotation. And uh, as we build homes, affordable housing isn't less than, and it shouldn't be built less than. And I think we have to, as an industry, um, make that statement that uh, these are homes well built. Energy certified, Energy Star, Indoor Air Quality Plus are some of the features that we build into. And I think we're getting better at that. Um, the term affordability, I, I've, I've heard used differently. I've heard uh, uh, local housing. So when you're speaking to neighbors in these communities, this is a local people. Um, uh, on, on the uh, our call earlier, Kate mentioned this idea of starter home. And that that's a great way to just approach, this is a, a smaller home. Um, uh, I think also in the conversation, it's always important to put a face to those people. And many times that is a word that's used quite often. I was one of those people when I first started. And so putting faces to uh, who are we really talking about and the people that serve us and or uh, fight for us, or firefighters or police departments or, or military, these let's put a face to what affordable housing really looks like. And if we can do a good job of, of, of presenting a product that fits into neighborhoods uh, and, and is, is uh, appealing. I think that we, it's somewhat of a two-way street, but it, it, is, it is something I think we'll always uh, battle with it to some degree or another. Thank you, such great insight there. Uh, Kate, additional thoughts? Yeah, so cities are economically their healthiest when they have housing that addresses every stage of a life cycle. And so sometimes what we call affordable housing is just the first step of housing. And it is what you get when you either graduate from high school and then leave your parents' home or, or college or you're first married. And um, what has really helped me is, is really digging into the numbers about what it means to have density near you, what that means for your property value, what that means for crime rates. Because a lot of what I was taught about how my property value will decrease if there is density near me or that crime will increase if there is density near me is they're based on studies from the 90s that they don't hold water anymore and they can't be replicated. And so some of that data is bad and it has informed a lot of our opinions for decades. Um, and so like when my husband and I, I live in Vineyard down in Utah County. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the state. And it has a lot of really interesting mixed use housing. And so every time we drive past one of the twin homes or townhome developments or apartments, I look at my husband and I'm like, oh, this is density. It's so hideous. It's like, it's beautiful. Like, it's so nice. It, it has enabled my city to have the people who work in our city live close to our city, mm -hmm. to have people who are single live in the apartments and then get married and move into the townhomes and then have kids and move into the houses. And there's a senior living facility by the lake. And, and that is what it is supposed to look like within your communities. And so when it just in terms of, of the phrase affordable housing, we just mean that everybody has access to start that housing cycle. Mm. I love that concept so much. Uh, I never heard that before, but it makes so much sense. David? You know, we're such a family oriented place. Um, Idaho is no different. Uh, Idaho and Utah both, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I hear so often, people expressing their desire that their children, their grandchildren can can grow up and stay and have a viable career close to home. You know, let's have the grandkids uh, where we don't have to hop on a plane to go visit. And, you know, here in Utah, we have one of the most diverse economies in the country, which means it doesn't matter whether you're an aerospace engineer or, you know, software developer. Um, Chance now, if you're a marine biologist, I'm not sure. Although we we have a good brine shrimp industry, but um, there are so many opportunities for our our children and grandchildren to grow and have a thriving career here, if they have housing they can afford. So uh, back to what you know, Bud's comment about those people. When we think about those people that need affordable rental housing for that period of their life, that's your children. That's your grandchildren that you want to have here 
long term. And they're going to go through these life stages and they need and that affordable housing that they rent for a time, uh, if it's if it's truly affordable, that gives them an opportunity to build that start building that that stability and start preparing for home ownership uh, so that they can uh, enter into that wealth building opportunity that, that we're all talking about. It's so important. Mm, I'm loving this housing as community building uh, kind of concept. Love that so much. Okay, resources for first time renters and home buyers. Any immediate quick responses there? Yeah. Uh, just, I, I think uh, last night and then tonight, uh, NeighborWorks is, is hosting our home buyer education. Mm -hmm. um, there have been times we've done this for many, many years, but there are times that people are just here to get that certificate so that, you know, they're already in a contract. This is the last step to their home process. Give me the contract. Let's move on. Yeah, I need that piece of paper. What we're seeing, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There is some education piece to that. But what we're seeing is families not in contract in some ways really discouraged about what's going on in the environment. Uh, and, and last night and tonight, we'll conclude tonight, are, are made up of, of folks that have never uh, been a homeowner before and they want to learn the process so that when that time comes, they're ready. Uh, understanding credit. I mean, this is a, 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 a big process and it takes a, a while to wrap your head around just to how interest rates are so uh, are critical and the real estate process and um, the home buyer, uh, as it relates to you know, home inspections and the realtor. So it, it's, we just really walk through that and um, have it's just been encouraged that when people came in last night and left last night, they're like, wow, that just makes so much more sense. And it actually gave them a little peace. I feel like this, is, this can be attainable. Learning a little bit at a time, giving them the book too. And our realtors do a great job of you know, helping uh, 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 kind of shepherd them through and our, and, and our bank commitment teams that come in and help people who have never done it before. So it's a wraparound process to help uh, folks. And I think that is a resource to the degree that we can encourage folks to be educated. They can make those right decisions to be ready when the time is right. Thanks so much. But I also want to add resources for women, minorities, veterans, first responders, uh, any additional resources you, you guys would like to share? Tema? I just feel like um, knowledge is power, right? And the sooner a family, even even right out of high school, I really think we we need to start younger, number one. And so parents, talk to your kids now about what credit means. You know, don't get that 10% credit card when you turn 18. And just honestly, little simple tips that are elementary maybe to us, but to them, it can be brand new, but start young. Let our, our kids need to learn young while they're 18, what it, before that, what it means to build credit, how to save money, how to budget, right? So that these spending behaviors are, we're not learning them later in life. And I think that's the biggest struggle is sometimes we, we don't realize, oh, that's why I should have started that two years ago, right? And so to everyone that's watching and that will watch, you should have a realtor in your community in your SOI, reach out to that realtor ASAP, right? Find somebody that you trust that will give you the right information and start the process now because affordability is relative to your current situation. And if you're renting, do your best to get out of renting so that you can start building equity. Thank you so much. And if you don't have someone, call Tema. Hey, uh, call and me. Your I can find a realtor anywhere <laughs> in the nation, in the world. I will find you a trust somebody that you can trust, because I feel like that's the biggest thing. And everything you discuss is confidential. So really, quick, really quickly. yeah, really quickly um, related to education um, here in Utah, we have a, a, a general financial literacy graduation requirement. Uh, we're the first state in the nation to, to do that. Mm. Um, it's still a work in process. We're still beefing up, you know, the, the teachers, the teacher credentialing, the curriculum. Well, the curriculum is, is embedded in what's called strands and standards. It's under the State Board of Education. I've reviewed those strands and standards and been involved in their uh, amendment several times now. Most recently, now that I'm here in the housing space, I reviewed those strands and standards and discovered there was nothing in there on home ownership. And I went, oh, how did we miss mm -hmm. this? So there's a draft new set of strands and standards, and there's a little snippet now that's been added that uh, uh, my team here at Utah Housing Corporation uh, uh, helped us put together. Um, and, and what we're thinking is, of course, like Tema said, I mean, 
plant the seed of possibility mm -hmm. with children across the socioeconomic spectrum, all ethnicities, all income levels. So even if you're coming out of a home where home ownership has not been a reality, I don't know that this is going to make a big impact, but hopefully, you know, if you plant that seed of possibility um, with our children when they're young, and it's one of the reasons why we founded the, the Women in the Money Financial Empowerment Conference is we know that generally women have a little bit more of an inside track to the minds and the aspirations uh, of their children. And so hopefully better empowered and, and informed women can help to have better empowered and informed children. And I agree with you, Tema, let's catch them when they're young, plant those seeds of possibility. Agreed, agreed. Thank you so much, David, for all of your work on that. Education is key. Uh, Want to jump to policy. Uh, let's jump over to Kate. What policy changes can the state and cities implement to help alleviate the housing crisis? And I know you've worked uh, closely with our legislature over the past four years. So talk to us about what's happening in Utah. Yeah, so before I get into that, I, I'm going to give you a couple numbers that they gave us at interim last month. So when the legislature met in October, um, they had an affordable housing presentation. And some of those numbers surprised me even because they're, they're even more kind of unbelievable than I thought that they would be. Um, but the average monthly home payment in December of 2021 was around $1,400. And in September of 2022, because of interest rates and the lack of homes to buy and price increases, it's 2650. So it's almost doubled, which is crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And so the, the median home price for a house in Utah is around $440,000, but the median income for household in Utah is about $65,000 which leaves a pretty big attainability gap for people who would like to buy a home in Utah. So in 2019, it was about 49% of Utahns couldn't afford the median home. In 22, it's about 76%. And a lot of that has to do with interest rates, but a lot of it also has to do with supply. And so for the last four years, the legislature has been working really hard to get cities and regions and counties to understand how important it is to have that availability of life cycle housing. So they, the legislature passed something called the Moderate Income Housing Plan that encourages cities to plan their infrastructure and their transportation around lots of different kinds of housing. They've made it easier to have accessory dwelling units, so to rent out your basement, because sometimes that can help you qualify for a home because it can be a source of income mm -hmm. and things like that. And then this next session, we're looking toward making sure that there are more single family homes on small lots. So nationwide, the average like lot size is 0.18. In Utah, it's about double that. And in some places that makes sense. In other places, it doesn't make sense to have those large of lot sizes, particularly because we're staring down so many different kinds of droughts and things like that. We already have a water shortage. Mm -hmm. um, but single family homes, we're down 20% in terms of building permits than we were last year. So because of the costs of labor and things like that, um, it's just gotten more expensive to build homes. It's gotten more expensive to buy homes. And so the legislature is going to address a few of the things that they can do up on the hill, but there's only so much that your state can do. Um, a lot of what happens is at the city level. And so it, it's really important, I think, for people who want to buy a home to understand exactly who is in charge of deciding where you can buy a home. And it's unfortunately not the state legislature um, because it, it's, it's pretty far removed from your community. So it's gonna be your city council, it's gonna be your mayor, your planning and zoning commissions. Um, Luckily, I think it's a little bit easier to get a hold of them. They're your, your neighbors. And um, it, that's going to be where I think it's really important for people who are concerned about these home prices, which I think it, everybody should be concerned about these because um, they're, they're astronomical. And so, so focusing on your, your local community and your local leaders, elected officials, is going to be really, really important in, in the coming days. Wow, okay, it's such valuable information there. David, additional thoughts you want to add? Well, I was going to mention we have a, you know, we serve low and moderate income families in our single family home operations. And I wanted to underscore what Kate pointed out uh, and that I failed to mention early on about headwinds. Um, and, and it's been said already, but the, the problems with um, lagging wage growth, you know, inflation has been hot uh, uh, with respect to so many other areas and things. 
not so hot in terms of wages. Um, we we have a look back to 2018. Our average home price that we finance, uh, the mortgages that we buy and service here at Utah Housing Corporation, we've seen a 64% increase since 2018 in the price of the median home. And during that same time frame, we saw a 35% increase in uh, average income. So, you know, that lagging wage growth, huge issue. What to do about it? You know, it's it's a market issue to a large extent. Hopefully, we'll see wages continue to to uh, catch up, but they will likely never pace. Uh, you know, with with other factors in inflation, but um, that's that's a huge issue. Yeah, yeah, uh, something I face every day as well in the corporate arena. Um, jump to the next question. Interested in disability specific information. So, any thoughts there on building accessible? housing with accommodations, but. Yeah, I uh, was recently in a wheelchair for four months and it gave me a perspective that uh, like many times Humbling. you uh, are somewhat didn't want obviously to start out with, but it did give me a huge perspective of some of the barriers that those that are in a wheelchair face, just simple things, going to the supermarkets, getting over curbs that just really cause a problem. And of course, housing uh, and the accessibility of those. Um, we've really made a commitment in our next subdivision. Uh, we've kind of built dirt to doorknob everywhere in between. We can manage that. <clears throat> but we've internally made that commitment to our, our, for our next project here in Boise, Corner, Cole, and Fairview. Uh, that whole subdivision will be visitable, uh, which allows uh, uh, folks uh, to get in. And not always a wheelchair. Sometimes it's walkers. It's other things, just amenities that need to be a more of a standard practice in many of our developments. And so uh, it's not easy. It's, it's very, um, you have to pay attention to the details <clears throat> because elevation really matters and depending on the site and the location that you, you know, there's some ways to manage that. But zero entry into your home uh, and throughout the neighborhood. You can go get your mail, you can go get to your garage. You, this zero entry co uh, conversation as it relates to um, uh, just being able to have that mobility, go to the garden beds that are within our pocket neighborhoods and, and be part of the community in that way. Then it's getting into your home. It's the accessibility from room to room and into your home, the widened door spaces, the being aware and being able to, to build uh, in a way that is can be accessible and or uh, to you know the max part of that would be ADA accessible, um, but it doesn't always have to hit that that bar depending on the family's needs. The fact that the subdivision and we can start thinking about how people move and how they get in and out of communities um, is is a critical point as as we and I think it is becoming more of an uh, awareness as development started to come in. Thank you so much, but so important. So calling in all builders to listen in on these conversations. Uh, next question, what are we doing to combat nimbyism? And I looked this up, I Googled it. Uh, the definition of this is the behavior of someone who does not want something to be built or done near where they live, although it does need to be built or done somewhere. Uh, I know this can lead to some controversial conversations, but any thoughts on that? How do we combat nimbyism? Well, I'll start. So I, I think change is hard for anybody. And if you've lived in a community that you've watched change around you, it can be difficult to make that adjustment. Um, but growth happens and it can happen to us or it can happen with us. And I think in a lot of communities, we let it happen to us and then we're really frustrated with traffic and with infrastructure um, and, and the way that it's played out. And so the best way I think to combat Nimbyism is to look for ways that we can plan for it and guide the growth in the future so that it benefits not only the people who live there already, but the people who would love to live there. And I love living in Vineyard and I would love for more people to live in Vineyard because it's been a great experience for me. And most people I think love their communities and would like to have other people have the opportunity to have a community like theirs, but they're afraid of what happens to to growth, but I, I would say that the, the negative aspects of growth, that it's what happens when it happens to us and not with us. So the more engaged that we can get with our city councils and the more engaged that we can get with the state in terms of making good plans to have all different kinds of housing uh, is gonna make that growth a little bit easier to deal with. And you know, I have neighbors who moved in around the same time I did, which was about five years ago. And we had a development that was up for 
uh, approval with our city council. And there were a lot of people who were upset. They were like, this is so much building. This is so much growth. And I felt like I had to remind them that the people who lived there before them voted to let them in, right? Just five years before. And yeah. now it was our turn to do something good and let someone else in so that they could also have the opportunity to go to our schools and our parks and to live close to the lake and to have a nice house with their family. And so we are communities, we are family oriented and we can grow in a really, really community oriented way that doesn't make it bad for the people who live there or the people who would like to live there. Yeah, we are things. so fortunate to have you leading in our community. <laughs> I'm just thinking of everything that you're saying. Sorry, David, go ahead. No, a couple of things come to mind. You know, we, we just have to keep uh, driving the notion and, and hopefully help more people to appreciate that diversity is a tremendous source of strength, whether we're talking diversity in terms of, of social uh, measures or economic measures. Diversity is a great source of strength to any community. That's number one. Number two is just, I, I would recap what, what I said earlier is as those people are your children and your grandchildren, <laughs> these are our communities. Uh, diversity is a great strength and our, our families, uh, on, on our extended families, we all want them to live there. I am looking at the clock. Thank you so much, David. Um, do you want like 30 second response on interest rates? <laughs> and inflation and then well, we'll do a final round of final comments and takeaways from the, the panel today yeah you know i kind of jumped on the interest rate question early in in the discussion um uh, as i said before don't hold your breath the federal reserve has made it clear they're absolutely committed to price stability in other words getting inflation under control they understand there's a, a very damaging impact uh they're destroying demand in the housing sector and they know it and they, they're not, it's not a concern for the Fed right now, and it's not going to be a concern for the Fed very soon. So we're probably, you know, a year or more out from, from uh, maybe seeing a so-called pivot and signs of release on the, uh, signs of relief on the interest rate front. Thank you so much for that economic outlook into 2023. So we're going to do a lightning round, final takeaways from today's conversation. Uh, let's start with Tema. Um, to what Kate just said, I actually went last night to my first ever city council planning meeting in Provo, Utah. And Yay. so that's what I want to share with everyone. Get involved with your community. Get involved with the city. Learn and understand. Um, and, and with regard to buying a home, just start now. Don't wait. Start now. Look into it. The market will be the market. It will change. It will evolve. But, but you can prepare yourself now. So thank, thank you, you so much, Tama. Uh, Kate. So I would just say that housing touches every aspect of your life. It touches how well kids do at school. It touches how well people can save for retirement. And if we want to have really healthy and independent communities, then we need housing and we need attainable housing. So like Thomas said, get involved, go to your city council meetings, come to the state legislature, let them know that housing is important to you because it's important to literally every part of Utah's economy and community. Love that so much, bud. Yeah, I think uh, um, however many people are on this call, your ideas matter. You have answers, you have input uh, that, that can reflect both in your neighborhood, within your cities. You know, resources are going to get just off of days, still a bit processing that, David. Sorry, I'm thinking next year and a half. Um, but the resources are there and there will, there will still be some there. I think the value of trying to keep those resources protected I think internally from uh, our perspective is looking at housing trusts. How can we create a one-time public investment that would create long-term portability? So I'm encouraged about this discussion. I'm encouraged about what's coming, even if it is some more interest rate. And uh, a person, you know, having everybody engaged in this conversation is critical in your own community. Thank you so much, Bud. And David? Just, just to tie on to what Tim has said, um, be persistent. Be creative, be resilient, and be patient. It will get better. And, and manage your expectations. Uh, try to step into, uh, if, if you aspire to home ownership, try to step into it now uh, to the extent that it can be made affordable. And that might mean you can't afford that quarter acre house with 2,500 square feet. Maybe it's a condo for starters. You know, Maybe it's a fixer upper. Um, be creative, flexible, and resilient. It will get better, uh, but patience will be key. 
Thank you so much, David. That's one thing I've learned in Utah. They love their land. <laughs> it's amazing. Coming from Washington, D.C., I'm like, all this land. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, so thank you all. I want to thank each of our guests for taking the time to join our conversation today. One voice, one story, one conversation can make the difference. And building an affordable and equitable housing market begins with us. It begins with me. It begins with Scott, David, Kate, Tema, Bud. And it begins with you. We encourage everyone who tuned in today to take what they have learned and continue the conversation in our homes, in our schools, and in the communities that we serve. This is how we will together set in motion a social and cultural shift that will lead to economic inclusion, prosperity, and growth. Thank you again for joining us today. Our next community speaker series will be a holiday social December 13th from 3.30 to 5.30 in partnership with Women Tech Council. This will be a hybrid event at our new technology campus in Midvale for Zions Bank Corporation. If you have not visited our new tech campus yet, we invite you to join us in person and check it out. Uh, we just opened up in August, so many of you have probably not been there yet. Uh, the theme will be investing in women, opportunity, access, and capital. We will feature four women in venture capital who will share their stories in a TED Talk format. There will be holiday music, holiday treats, and a whole lot of holiday cheer. So all of our community speaker series are open to the entire community. They are free of charge, but registration is required. So please mark your calendars and be on the lookout for the invite. Until then, we wish you a fantastic rest of your day. Bye-bye now.